Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas, everybody. A few people say, where have you guys been? We've been like little elves helping out all over the diocese. All the churches who are, uh, who are short clergy, we've been uh, off all around, even out to Clewiston. So it's been, a, we've been busy. But it's so good to see everybody this morning. Um, it is the last day of Christmas, okay? So it's 12th night. We've had our full 12 days of celebration and, and, uh, and joy and gift giving and all that wonderful stuff. And tomorrow we start a new feast. I love being a Christian because it's like one awesome celebration after the other. Just party, party, party. So tomorrow, tomorrow we celebrate the feast of the epiphany. Anybody ever heard of that? Does that ring a bell with any of you? Yeah, okay, good. That's good. Good Episcopalian. So, who's, right, so Christmas, right, the Feast of the Nativity, we celebrate whose arrival? Jesus, exactly. The Epiphany, what kicks off the Epiphany? Whose arrival starts the Epiphany? It was in the Gospel. Yes, the wise men. Very good. So the wise men's arrival um, kicks off the season of Epiphany. And I want to point something out to you. And I'm not, I'm not being grinchy, okay? I'm just, there's something that you do sometimes called a close reading of the text. So I want to point out something that you may not have noticed. And that is... Our gospel passage about the arrival of, uh, of the three kings doesn't call them kings, right? They're wise men, not kings. Some translations say magi. And it doesn't say that there are three of them. Did anybody ever notice that? It does not say that there are three kings. It just says wise men from the east arrived. So there may have been three. <clears throat> they brought three gifts, so I think that's what a lot of people put that together with. But um, there were wise men, not kings. The Magi were um, astronomers. They were probably um, religious leaders. We think that maybe they were followers of Zoroastrianism, which was an eastern uh, religion east of, of, of Israel. And so they were also kind of dignitaries, right? Because they came from another country and they checked in with Herod, the, the ruler of, of Judea at the time. And so um, it's interesting. It's a little, a little different sometimes than, than what we get, but they were very important people. And so what I want to do today with you, today, today being the last day of Christmas and us this kind of being a pivot day, when we start living in the season of Epiphany, I want to talk to you about what Epiphany really means and what these wise men have to teach us today because they have a lot to teach us. And I'm going to start with a story about my husband. <laughs> I'm not going to tell you a story about myself. I'm going to tell you a story about him. I cleared this, so I'm okay, right? I'm not, I'm not doing anything I'm not supposed to do. So... This, um, I'm going back now a few years, right? This was actually before Jeff and I were even married. We were still dating. Jeff enrolled in something called the Diocesan School for Christian Studies. Now, some of you may have heard of that. A lot of you probably haven't, but it doesn't exist anymore. But at the time, um, it was a training program that met at St. Mark's School in Fort Lauderdale, all the way down in Fort Lauderdale, on the weekends, and it was a three-year program, and it was taught by, uh, excuse me, by um, priests throughout the diocese, and it was for lay people who wanted to deepen their faith and study a little more systematically, study scripture and history, but it was also served as the training ground for people who wanted to be ordained as deacons, so ordained uh, permanent deacons, we call them now. So now, so Jeff enrolled in this school, not really sure what was going to happen, and eventually he entered into the, the diocesan process of discernment about becoming ordained as a deacon. And um, he 
thoroughly enjoyed it. I enrolled too later. I was you know, studying as a layperson. And so just really bonded with the people in his class and it was a great time and they, a lot of them were going through this process as well. But the Commission on Ministry, which is the diocesan committee that kind of shepherds people through this, asked Jeff to take a year off from the process. And they said, we want you to take a year and consider what kind of ministry God is really calling you to. Well, you were kind of taken aback with that, right? It was a surprise. We didn't really expect that. And um, shortly after all that had tra uh, transpired, we were attending the ordination ceremony for a lot of Jeff's friends, his classmates who were being ordained as deacons. And um, at that point, we were married. And so we're, we're walking down at the cathedral in Miami, if you know it at all, to the reception after the service, um, walking together. <laughs> and suddenly, we both heard this voice. Jeff. Jeffrey! <laughs> we both kind of froze and looked at each other and turned around, and it was a man named Horace Ward, who's a priest in the diocese, of just a lovely guy with a fabulous island accent. Well, have you accepted your true calling to be a priest? Well, that was not on our radar screen. We hadn't really discussed it. And a lot of you know my husband. For the first time, perhaps ever, I saw him at a complete loss for words. He started sweating and hemming and hawing. He didn't know what to say. And it, was, uh, it was really one of those moments that was a pivotal moment in our lives together. And uh, it was a moment of epiphany for both of us. It was a moment of revelation and also of confirmation. Because the reality was, I knew he was called to be a priest. He didn't know it yet. <laughs> I didn't know I was called to be a priest either. So, you know, I would imagine that most of us sitting here today have had some kind of an epiphany moment with the Lord. An epiphany moment is an aha moment. It's a moment as I said, of both revelation and confirmation. From the Greek, it means manifestation. That's the, that's the Greek translation of the word epiphany. In an epiphany, truth, God's truth, is made manifest for us in a palpable way, in a, in a tangible kind of way. You know, sometimes the things God reveals to us in our epiphany moments are simple. You know, that maybe, gosh, I can't keep eating a bowl of ice cream every night and be at the weight that I want. I mean, I know that sounds trivial, but sometimes we have these moments where the, just the realization settles in. And some, some would call that common sense, right? But, you know, still, we have these moments. But then other, other moments of epiphany are really more profound. Um, and I would say, if, if any of you sitting here today feel like, gosh, I haven't really ever had that epiphany moment. I haven't had a moment when I really felt like God was revealing truth to me. Just ask. And you will. But we'll talk more about that in a minute. So, epiphany, manifestation, a revealing, a confirmation, a, a revelation of truth. So why are the wise men in the scriptures and in the church calendar linked with epiphany? Well, for several reasons, and I imagine you could probably guess some. But one is, first, in a sense, these wise men had an amazing epiphany that there was a child that had been born who was truly the king of the Jews. God made this truth known to them. I mean, it, if you consider, these are people living far away from Jerusalem, far away from Bethlehem. You know, there was no internet. 
<laughs> there was no um, easy communication between cultures, how did they even know this, right? Well, God made it known to them. And the interesting thing is they were not afraid to share what God had revealed to them. You know, the arrival of the wise men um, at the birth of Jesus confirmed to the wise men themselves that there was a new king. So they arrived, and yes, it was confirmed for them that this is really what had happened. But it also confirmed, it also was an epiphany for Mary and Joseph and the shepherds and everyone whom the angels had told about this miraculous event. It was a confirmation for them that all this was true. So there was a lot of revelation happening around this event. And I, I just want to stop and pause for a moment and, and say, you know, when God guides us, when he gives us an understanding of truth, when he's teaching us, we can depend on him to confirm that, right? God doesn't ask us to kind of launch off and do kind of crazy, well, God does ask us to launch off and do crazy things. I mean, he does, but we as believers can know that he will confirm that this is truly his leading. And he graciously did that with Mary and Joseph. Yes, everything I've told you is true. Second, the arrival of the wise men provided an aha moment on an even grander scale. Dignitaries, respected leaders traveling from a faraway nation to pay homage to Jesus as king manifested a mind-blowing truth, and that's this, that Jesus, this child, was not born just to be a Messiah for the Jewish nation. He was born to be Messiah for the whole world, every person of every nation. Now, this is not breaking news for us, right? We talk about it all the time. I mean, we're beneficiaries of that as, as, uh, as non-Jews, as Gentiles. But at the time, this was pretty astonishing. I mean, you can go back and search the scriptures and see how God was preparing people to understand that Jesus was Messiah for the whole world. But it, it was kind of an added-on idea for, for a lot of practicing Jews. Jesus was a fully Jewish Messiah, and that's what they were looking for and expecting. But the arrival of, of the wise men signaled that something much bigger was going on, that God was up to something far greater than anyone had suspected. And guess what? He always is. God is always, always up to more than we think. Oh. <laughs> Thanks. So, that's why the arrival of the wise men ushers in the church season of Epiphany. And that's great. We're living that reality that Jesus is the Messiah for all. But what else can the wise men teach us as followers of Jesus? A lot, actually. A lot. You know, I have to stop for a second. I was admiring your um, fabulous nativity scene over here. And I love the wise men. They look, they look very kind of Peter Max, like stylized. They're really cool looking. So you can just kind of focus on that for a little bit as a visual later. They're, they're so cool. So these, these mystical looking men, what do they have to teach us? Well, first, I want to say the wise men were wise because they were seeking, right? They came to Mary and Joseph and they said, 
well, actually, they came to Herod. They came to the, the, the official ruler and said, where is the child? Because we observed his star at its rising. They were studying. They were looking. They were watching. They were asking questions. So long before they ever showed up at Jesus' house, they were observing and asking questions. And I want to ask you all something. Do you ever ask? God questions? I'll bet you do. Sometimes I ask questions like, why is this still going on? Or, you know, they're very personal. But broadening that scope, I believe truly that through prayer and study and talking to other Christian believers, God loves it when we engage in kind of a holy curiosity about the world that he created, about what he wants us to do in it, about what he's doing in our community and how we can be a part of it. You know, Jesus says very specifically that we as his followers are to ask and to seek and to knock. So the first thing that I want all of us to learn from the wise men is to be curious in a holy way. Be observers of the world and it's in the environment you find yourself in and what God is up to. It's amazing what God is doing that sometimes completely, I, I don't even notice it's going on right on, uh, under my nose. But if I stop and look, I can see a lot. Now make no mistake, God <laughs> often breaks into our lives um, completely on his own accord, right? I mean, I've had those times too. Um, but seeking. He often shows us things after we've been seeking for a while. Second, when the wise men received new information from God, right, they saw the star, they interpreted its meaning, they rearranged their lives. You know, they took a journey that was not easy you know, this is not hopping into the, gar and, uh, into the car and heading down to the garden small for the afternoon. I mean, travel then was extremely difficult and very dangerous. When you consider the valuable gifts that they were carrying, they were targets for robbers and, and uh, kind of what, desert pirates, right? But they undertook this incredibly difficult journey they rearranged their lives. You know, when, when Jeff did accept his call to, to, uh, to be ordained as a priest, we rearranged our lives. And I'm going to be honest, it was not always comfortable. You know, Jeff, the first year that he was in seminary, commuted back and forth from Florida to Connecticut. He was home one week a month, and it was, it was really hard. It was very difficult. Um, but we receive so much from being willing to give up some of our comfort and to change our path because God had asked that of us. A, thou a million fold what we gave up. So I just want to encourage you that when God when God points you in a new direction, when God gives you a new understanding, don't be afraid to rearrange your life to accommodate that new truth. And finally, the wise men paid homage to King Jesus. You know, they didn't just come to say hi. Or do a quick fact check, like, okay, this, were, this is what our calculation said. Is it right? Yep, high five. Okay, see you later. It wasn't like that at all. They came to pay tribute to King Jesus. You know, they made thoughtful and careful and costly preparations and brought valuable gifts gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And in doing that, and giving those gifts to Jesus, they made a tangible, concrete,
concrete acknowledgement of allegiance to this baby who was the Messiah. This tribute is right and good. When we have an epiphany of God's truth, of who he is, of how much he loves us unconditionally, when we say these words again and again, but there are those times when God makes them real to our heart, and it is mind-blowing. When we realize these truths, that he's made us esteemed sons and daughters in his family, what is an appropriate response? It is good and holy to pay tribute to Jesus, to worship him by giving intentionally of our time and our talent and our treasure. You know, today marks the beginning of St. Mary's Stewardship Series. And when I read the scriptures for today, I thought, this is beautifully purposed. You know, the wise men paid tribute to Jesus, and we are called to pay tribute to God as well. You know, a lot of times stewardship, um, in stewardship, we hear talks that are good, they ask us to support important programs and ministries, to help with outreach, to care for the buildings and grounds that we have so that they'll be here for future generations. And that is all true. Those are all important reasons to give to ministry. But I ask you to consider today that giving intentionally and generously to God of our time and our talent and our treasure is really at its heart about acknowledging Jesus as our true king. That our allegiance to him comes before everything else. That giving as an act of worship is the priority in our lives. You know, January is kind of a time when we've come out of this wonderful, busy, exciting, joyful season. And a lot of people use this time to kind of collect ourselves and say, you know, what are my priorities and time and, you know, um, just my commitments and things like that. And I ask you this year to really clarify, spend some time intentionally clarifying where and how you're expressing your commitment. Commitment to Christ in a tangible way will set your whole life in order. God takes what we give and multiplies it in beautiful and powerful ways. You know, a lot of scholars believe that the gold that the wise men gave to the Holy Family, to Jesus and Mary and Joseph, is how they were actually able to afford their flight to Egypt. If you recall, Herod wasn't too keen on the fact that a newborn king existed, and God told Joseph in a dream that they had to leave Israel and flee to Egypt for Jesus' safety. Because the wise men worshipped Jesus, by bringing those expensive gifts, Jesus and his family were able to com complete the will of God for that point in their lives. So this establishes a pattern for us that when we give in worship, God uses those gifts to continue his ministry in the world around us. So, I ask you today, what aha moments has the Holy Spirit given you? Have you been seeking them? I encourage you to do so. How have you responded? Have you been willing to rearrange your life? You can start small. You can 
just saying, you can start small, that's okay, but start. And are you willing to worship, to pay homage to Jesus in concrete, tangible ways by giving of your time and your talent and your treasure? I know you all a little bit, and I believe you are. I believe you receive God's truth. I believe you're willing to rearrange your lives, and I believe you are willing to pay tribute to Christ in worship. And together, we'll do all of these things. Amen.